just as a hydrogen ion. Right? We have to be careful with that because we will see other reactions where the hydrogen atom appears to be moving around. And it won't be a hydrogen atom. It will be a hydride ion. Hydride is distinctly different from hydrogen ion. They're both hydrogen atoms, and they're both charged. But a hydrogen ion is positively charged, and a hydride is negatively charged. Drastically different in what they end up doing. Massively different enzymes to go through and deal with those processes. Okay. Your substitution reactions were a lot more important for organic chemistry. It needs to kind of be deleted um, from biochem because I don't think we see a whole lot of substrate substitution reactions. Okay. But as the name kind of suggests, you're just exchanging one atom for another. Okay. And that's what these pieces are trying to show. In elimination, you're going to remove two sigma bonds. Okay, and this is something that can be tricky, which you may remember from organic chemistry. There are two sigma bonds broken in the elimination. There's one to that LG, and the other one is to... Okay. Yeah. Nope. To a implied hydrogen on that structure. We're removing that hydrogen as well. Okay. So we have to be careful because implied hydrogens can come back and potentially haunt you. Um, again, biochemists tend to just show everything, so the structures look a lot messier, and they tend to be drawn in Fisher projections. Um, and when in that format, you'll see all the hydrogens. They don't, they don't show up as implied. But when we form a double bond, you're looking at an elimination reaction. Your addition reactions, we're doing the reverse. We're adding something to a double bond, so we lose the double bond. Two more kind of terms that will pop up. You will see isomerization and reduction in oxidation reactions. Okay. And this is actually when I learned that this slide was a bit premature because I was like, I know I talked about redox reactions, but I thought I talked about it before. I was remembering building the slides. Within the next 10 slides, we'll be talking about redox, redox reactions. Um, so I'll make an adjustment on some of these structures so that we can get a, a decent pattern so that when you see a reaction, you can say, okay, this type of reaction is occurring. And I'll also try and include within that slide set um, or that new slide what the enzyme is that does that type of reaction. Okay. So enzyme nomenclature tends to be awful, but there are certain names that are fairly characteristic. So one that you might remember, because we have talked about it, kinase. Kinases will always transfer phosphates, okay. um, which technically would be a substitution reaction. So we do see substitution. Okay. So if you can recognize the type of reaction occurring, sometimes you can trigger on the name of the enzyme associated with that reaction, and that can help you come up with names, particularly in a multiple choice system. Okay, kind of makes sense? Are a lot of the enzymes that way where specific enzyme transfers specific atoms or just kind of a mess? A, a lot of them are, <clears throat> but it is kind of a mess. So I hated organic nomenclature when I went through and took organic, and then I took biochem and I was like, holy crap, organic is amazing when it comes to nomenclature. Because the, the nomenclature na system for anything that biochemistry touches is awful. Uh, and I think that's largely because there's still so much we don't know. So when we came up with organic nomenclature, we came up with strict rules, and then we kept modifying them. But we modified the rules that we already had, and so we could kind of come up with conditionals. With biochem, depending on how an enzyme was discovered, um, like a classic one is a dehydrogenase. Okay, well, D means not and hydrogenase, meaning hydrogen. So a lot of the kind of classic ideas on a dehydrogenase is removing hydrogen. Enzymes catalyze both directions. When they happen to discover several of these enzymes, they discovered it removing hydrogen in the biological system. It does the reverse. Okay. So some of the nomenclature kind of makes sense to sort of What's the overall thing happening? We're either adding or removing hydrogen. You have to be a little bit careful with some of those names. Okay, reductases, same kind of idea. Okay. 
Um, so this next slide is going to take forever to load, more than likely, and then I'm also going to go out to the internet so we can see it a little bit cleaner. Um, oh, it actually loaded nicely. <clears throat> so what you see there is biochemistry as we know it. And technically, it is only one-third of biochemistry as we know it. Okay. Um, biochem is kind of classified into three main categories. We get your protein, okay, um, uh, I can't think of the word, protein biochemistry, your DNA, your genetic information biochemistry, uh, and then kind of your carbohydrates. What we're looking at here is kind of a mix of the protein and the carbohydrates. So all those tiny little circles and lines that you're seeing there are the reactions as we know them in biochemistry. And yeah, you might recognize some pieces. Right there in the middle, we've got the Krebs cycle. Or our citric acid cycle, yep. Okay. Uh, and so we will be looking at the citric acid cycle. I think that's chapters 18 and 19 maybe. Uh, and we're also going to look at glycolysis. Right? So I personally find this absolutely fascinating that someone was able to put this all together. And this is one of the reasons why biochemistry as a class is kind of odd to teach just in general because that hardly scratches the surface of everything we know that's happening in biochem. And yet this is allegedly what we're trying to teach you. Okay. So the level at which you look at it becomes important. Okay. So we spent the first half of the semester going through the individual pieces. What are um, amino acids? What are the intermolecular forces? Let's see, I think it is going. It has a really hard time loading it. It is looking at some kind of the basics of energy changes. So when we're looking at our metabolic pathways, one of the big things coming out of the metabolic pathways is where do we get energy from? Okay. What can we do with that energy? Build, destroy, all of those kind of ideas. Well, if we're going to go through and look at things in that fashion, we have to have some idea of what our energy is. Okay. So this comes back to Gibbs free energy, which we talked about way, way long ago with uh, chapter one. Okay. And we'll now start to bring in some concepts of what those equations mean and how we can manipulate those. So when we're looking at an individual reaction, all reactions that are going to be productive need to go down in energy. Okay, our products always need to be lower in energy than our reactants. Well, how can we get that to happen? That seems a bit odd. How can we always go lower in energy? If I take a ball and put it on the top step, when I let go of the ball, it'll roll all the way down to the bottom step. How does that reaction start again? You have to put energy in. I have to put energy in. But if I just said... We can only go down. How do we get the ball back up to the top? We need some source of energy to start this. Okay, well, where do animals get their source of energy? Heat. From plants. Okay, well, where do plants get their energy to make that source? They're using solar energy. So it's all ultimately coming back to the energy we're getting from the sun. That light energy is being harvested and used to put the ball back at the top of the ladder that can then fall back down again. Okay? And as life has kind of built, is looking at each of those steps to say, how can I use the energy as it's released? Okay? If it can't use that energy, then it's just releasing it, and what we have is an explosion. Okay? That's not really conducive to life. Okay? So when we're looking at each of our reactions, we'll reference the energy change within it. Okay? And that's our Gibbs free energy. However, there ends up being two Gibbs free energies. Okay. Those of you have 152, can you help me out with what those differences in those Gibbs free energies are? So it sounds like Jimmy at least has a vague recollection. Do you remember? The uh, no. circle thing means. Standard conditions. Okay. So, what are standard conditions? One atmosphere, I think, at 20 degrees or 25 degrees Celsius. 
those standard conditions apply back to this expression. Okay? Our RT, LN concentration of our products held to their coefficient, concentration of, uh, well, times each of them, divided by the concentration of reactants to their coefficients from our balanced equation. Okay. So <clears throat> what happens at standard conditions? Okay. Your standard condition value will equal the Gibbs free energy for the overall reaction. So when are those two going to be equal to each other? Under what conditions will this term not have an impact? What value does this term have to be? Has to equal zero. Okay. So what would allow that to become zero? No. Yeah, equilibrium will actually, um, no, sorry, yes. Yes, no, yes. Equilibrium will work. Okay. Um, our standard conditions can be one molar for each of these, okay. one atmosphere. Another thing that will get floated out there will be temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. So those will then allow certain conditions to be set that allows us to solve for the delta G naught. Okay. Uh, and actually, yeah. Okay. So what we're attempting or what we could potentially do is use that information to manipulate out. This is effectively the equilibrium constant. Okay. But what if we're not at equilibrium? Okay. If, we're, if this is the equilibrium constant, then this term ends up coming out at zero. What well, sucks? There is no free energy change because we are at the exact value. Okay. So what we need to do is vary off of equilibrium. The instant we are off of equilibrium, our delta G becomes a reasonable value okay, that we can potentially use. So when we vary off of equilibrium, those values change, which then in turn changes the delta G for our reaction. And theoretically, we want our delta G to be negative, negative okay, because that's the release of energy. That's our favorable equation. When we look at our reactions, you'll notice that they'll show positive delta Gs in there and saying, for a course of a reaction, oh, we have a positive delta G. Well, how did we get that positive delta G reaction to work? Yeah, put energy in. You had to put energy in in some other fashion. So you'll end up adding equations together. To get that one reaction to occur, we have to run another reaction over the top of it okay, to make up that energy loss. So you end up having to go through and do a, a careful dance between those reactions to get it to work out. Okay? So in cases where you have a positive delta G for a reaction, what might be a common reaction to run at the same time? Where can we get a lot of energy from? ATP, breaking down ATP. Break down ATP. Okay? So if we've got a reaction that's going to go up in energy, we'll typically run it at the same time as with ATP. Because okay, ATP will then release that energy and make up that difference, allowing it to process through. Okay. So, all back to where we start, puts our, our ball at the top of our ladder. Okay. Hydrogen in the sun generates light energy, hydrogen being turned into helium, which is a process known as fusion. It's fusion. That's why we're trying to get cold fusion. It's an awesome source of energy. That releases energy into photosynthesis. Okay. Plants absorb that light, convert CO2 and water into glucose. That gives us another high energy molecule that we can then process via animals, turn it into ATP. Once we have that ATP, we can now process that into our proteins and amino acids and nucleotides to continue life as we know it. It all ultimately comes back to using that sun, okay? which applies to even just how we move around. Okay? When we try and move around, what do we end up needing to use? How'd you get here today? The car. The car. Okay. Well, how did you get the energy from the car? The gas from the gas station. Where did the gas station get its energy from? From the ground. From the ground. 
trapped CO2 from old dead plants. We're then releasing that trapped CO2 back into the environment, but we aren't consuming it. So that CO2 is now changing our environment, right? How much it's changing it, where it's coming from, and all of those processes are the parts that are up for debate in some circles, okay? But it's what's happening with it. We are now releasing the CO2 that isn't being consumed elsewhere, okay? And some things will come up to try and consume it, like algae. So we get massive algae blooms in the ocean in different uh, stagnant pieces of water. Why? There's now tons of energy, tons of things that it can grab with that CO2. It can then process and use the energy from the sun that hasn't been used by something else and eat that CO2 because there's an excess of it now. And so it starts to increase these algae blooms. Okay. So we can get this big massive system that ideally we go all the way back to using our motion from the sun, then we don't have to worry about that because we aren't incorporating another step in that process. Okay. So in our metabolism, what we're going to be concerned about is we have two major categories, catabolism and anabolism. Okay. I don't ever remember the difference between these two. Some other people seem to do better at it than me. So we'll look it up. I think the next slide shows something. In catabolism, you're taking large molecules and you're breaking them down. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a release in energy. Okay. Uh, you'll be transferring electrons uh, to acceptor molecules. This is an overall process of oxidation. Okay. So we take electrons from one source and we dump them to a different source. Okay. So our original source lost electrons. Loss of electrons is oxidation. How many of you remember that? Ouch. You need to remember that. It's in there somewhere. Okay. Anabolism, we're taking small molecules to build larger ones. Okay, why would we want to build larger molecules? Energy. We could store energy. We are a conglomeration of lots and lots of molecules. If we didn't build larger molecules, <laughs> we wouldn't exist. So we want this ability to build larger molecules. This is going to require energy because okay, we have to build things larger. This is going to involve the acceptance of electrons. By accepting electrons, we're doing the reverse of oxidation. We now have reduction, okay? which may seem a little bit weird. Reduction means build up. Build up. Okay. You're reducing actually the oxidation number. You've got to be careful with charge. Okay. So it's a little bit kind of counterintuitive in those ties, but it's coming from where and how those things were individually discovered. Okay. So if we move to energy diagrams on how can we actually put this together into an expression that we can then understand and see. Okay. Well, an energy diagram is going to require a reactant, and it's going to require a product. Okay. Well, if this is my reactant energy, where should my product energy be? It depends on what I'm looking at, okay? If we're going to say catabolism, the product energy needs to be lower, lower in energy. Okay, well, how do you know it needs to be lower in energy? Because it releases energy. It releases energy, so you had to know what catabolism was, okay? Again, I can't seem to remember that, so I had to found this little meme here. Well, I remember it because cats are destructive. And that's exactly what this is for. This is how I now remember it. So, for better or worse, there's well, another idea. So, we'll tag both those on there. So, cats are destructive, and anabolic, as in anabolic steroids. Yeah. Which, did I spell that right? Let's just put in two eyes. <laughs> You're covered. One way I'm right. Okay. So if we were going to look at our energy diagram again, catabolic, what's going to happen? Energy release. Energy release. So we're going to look at our reactants, and our products need to be lower in energy. When we look at our overall reaction, we're going to have an activation energy. We'll have a transition state, which is the top of our curve. The distance between our reactant energy and our product is our delta G. Okay. 
This top half of our curve is all about how fast the reaction occurs, which is our kinetic aspect. The bottom half is the energy concern, which is then going to be our thermodynamic. What would our anabolic reaction look like? Because I'm going to erase that. Going to require energy, so where should our, our reactive energy is here? Where should the product be? It needs to be higher in energy. Okay. Our delta G is again going to be the difference between our reactants and products, but because our product energy is higher than our reactants, our delta G becomes positive in this case. It's now greater than zero, and in the other case, it was less than zero. Okay. Our activation energy, whoops. Sorry, my screen, you can see that. It's still, again, your reactants to your products. Transition state is still at the peak. Okay. Kinetics. Whoops. Kinetics is going to be this whole distance. That's an eraser. All the way down to our reactant. And our thermodynamics is sitting in with that delta G. Right? Questions about either of those? How did I say our reactions always have to function? Down in energy. How do we ever get anabolic reactions to work? Because you have to use the energy from catabolic reaction to make an anabolic You'll be stacking two reactions with each other. So when we look at an energy diagram, we may see energy diagrams that go up in energy. We're like, well, we can't do that. Okay, you're right, we can't do that. We end up running a simultaneous reaction that shows the net result where the product is lower in energy. Okay. Our reactant energy will get boosted higher in energy to account for that. Okay. When we look at the energy diagram, we may not actually show that. Okay. What we may end up showing is just the, the big thing that's happening. Okay. Taking glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. All we're doing is putting a phosphate group. Okay, I'm not going to draw that structure. But we can talk, and we'll talk about this again. We have glucose plus phosphate. Just get rid of that symbol for the moment. To become glucose 6 phosphate. Okay. That reaction is building up. We're making that molecule larger. That's an anabolic reaction. Okay. But that reaction is or as it is anabolic, goes up in energy. Okay, which means it will not occur on its own. So how does life get around that issue? Because that's an, a critical step. Without putting that phosphate on, glycolysis does not work. How do we get that to occur? You have to add ATP. The ATP will get produce ADP plus a phosphate. That phosphate is what's being consumed in the previous reaction. So while I may be getting a positive value for that top reaction, I'm getting a very, very large negative value for the other one. The net result is that I have a negative answer. When we look at the energy diagram, we'll only look at the energy diagram for the glucose to the, plus the phosphate. We very rarely add the ATP into that energy diagram. Why? I don't know. Okay. But that's how we've drawn it. Okay. So be aware that when you look at your diagrams, it may look like you're doing something where you're going up in energy and that's not allowed. The reason it's not allowed is something else has to be happening at the same time. We can do that by adding in something like ATP or other high energy particles. Kind of make sense? So don't look at a reaction and say, oh, that can't possibly happen. You're right. It can't possibly happen on its own, and it won't. Okay? Something else is there to help shift that balance. Okay? Question. Um, so I real quickly threw this in there because I didn't think I had that previous slide with our um, delta G expression. Uh, so let's do some quick discussions on our equilibrium constant. Our equilibrium constant is our products over our reactants, officially up to their particular um, react, held to their coefficient from the balanced equation. What would a large K value mean? Your 
your products are very heavily favored okay, at equilibrium. So if we looked at the concentration of reactants and products at the end of the reaction, we would expect a lot of products. Okay? What would that suggest about the delta G for the reaction? It's negative. It should be very, very negative because it's favoring the product formation. Okay? That's kind of the big idea I want you to get out of that. After that, you can go back and use, and I don't want to go back, but I've got a kind of tiny font there. Our delta G will be equal to your standard, Gibbs free energy, plus RT ln. It's technically Q because we won't be at equilibrium. Okay. And you can plug in concentrations for your products and reactants to be able to solve for the delta G for any given reaction. Okay. The only reason I mention it is because it is in the homework. I do expect you to kind of do it once in the homework. I will never ask you to do that calculation in class. Okay? Or on an exam. Does that make sense? Okay. So, oxidation states. Okay, determining oxidation states. Uh, I thought this stepped. This did not step. That's nice. Okay, so let's pretend we're, we can't see anything. Just erase those. Let's just erase all of that. Why not? Okay. For an individual reaction, we want to be able to predict what things changed. Okay. So one of the things we talked about was looking at substitution or addition reactions, identifying those. A lot of the reactions that we'll run in biochem will involve oxidation and reduction, which then means we need to be able to identify what was the primary thing that happened, okay. which should already start to scream, that's a little bit weird to ask anybody to do. Because when we talk about oxidation and reduction, typically how is it referenced? They all happen together. They happen at the same time. You can't do oxidation without reduction. And yet we'll still look at a reaction and say, oh, that's a reductase because it reduced. Well, by definition, it also oxidized. So why are we calling it an oxidation reaction versus a reduction reaction? Why can we now separate them when in Gen Chem we had to keep them together? comes down to the substrate you're looking at. You're evaluating that substrate and saying, what happened to it? Was it oxidized or was it reduced? Okay. The name for your enzyme will then come based off of that, even though the enzyme is doing the opposite of what happened to it. Okay. They're both happening in concert, but we're only concerned about one species. In organic, the same thing kind of happened. Okay. We don't care about balancing a reaction. We care about the organic molecule, the larger piece. Biochem is now taking that a step further and doing the same kind of concept to it. So before we can even get into looking at those, we need to make sure we can identify oxidation states. Okay? So this is a, a relatively straightforward question from 152. We should be able to determine the oxidation states for every single atom on each side of the equation. Yes, biochem gets more complicated. Well, actually, it doesn't get all that much more complicated because typically we deal with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So three on each side, you just have to figure them out. Okay. Um, here, we've got to do the same thing. So how do we determine the oxidation states? Okay. So we're going to go through the general rules here first, and we'll look at shortcuts when it comes to ultimately organic and biochem, but we need to make sure we've got some idea of what's happening within this. Determine oxidation states, we have to have... Just checking to see if I gave you a rule set. It looks like I didn't. Okay. We need to have some general concept on it. So there's a couple big things that you have to have memorized. Uh, good, it didn't do anything. The oxidation state of oxygen is always negative 2. Okay. There is... It's, it, that will be part of it, but looking at deciding the oxidation state of oxygen being negative 2 does not go back to how many electrons it has, or even the charge that we typically associate with oxygen. The charge is related to the oxidation state, but you determine the charge from oxidation states, not vice versa. Okay. Um, so why is oxygen always a negative 2 and we not have to worry about it in other cases? Okay. Well, oxygen is the most electronegative element, second most electronegative element. Okay. That's where its balance to its charge and its balance of electrons comes in really handy of it always being a negative two. It will always take electrons from other elements because it's the most electronegative. 
There's two exceptions to that, potentially. What are those two exceptions? If you bond it to fluorine, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, okay? which means fluorine will take the electrons from oxygen. Oxygen can't be a negative two. The other exception? What happens when you bond it to another oxygen? Okay. They're both equally fighting for the electrons. How do they decide which one gets the electron? They don't. They split the two electrons, which then means it comes out at a negative one. We don't encounter fluorine number one. Okay. We also don't encounter the peroxides. I don't think we encounter the peroxides uh, in biochem. Okay. It is something that is dangerous within biochem, hence free radicals. What are they talking about? An oxygen with only a single electron in a negative one oxidation state. Okay. That's a problematic oxygen. Okay, so our oxidation state of oxygen is always a negative 2. And then there's another one that will help us out. We'll come to that one. Hydrogen is always a plus 1. Okay. And then elements in their natural state is a rule that you've got memorized. And I would argue that that's an extra rule that you don't need. Okay. These two you absolutely need to have memorized. Okay. There are some others that can kind of float in there, like halogens, okay. getting their oxidation states. They're typically negative one. Okay. Rule three is going to become the most important one. Your charge is always specified for you. Where is the charge always given? The top right corner of every structure, okay. or every atom if we look at larger structures. Okay, it specifies the charge. The sum of the oxidation numbers or oxidation states equals the charge. Okay. With these three rules, we can for sure determine everything that's happening up here. So if we look at I2O5, okay, what is the oxidation state for the oxygen in I2O5? It is negative 2. Our rule is that it's always negative 2. Okay, what is it in carbon monoxide, the CO? Negative 2. Negative two. It's always negative 2, so we don't have to worry about that one. What about the oxygen? Or, sorry, not the oxygen, the other atom. Are we looking at each individual oxygen? We will have to look at each individual. Well, so we started with each individual oxygen, but then go back to rule number 1. It's always negative 2. Well, if it's always negative 2, I can apply... Oxygen on both sides of the equation being negative 2. doesn't matter how many different times it shows up. It will always be negative 2. Okay. There's sort of one exception, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that when we look at I2. Okay. What happens to our iodine? So what is the oxidation state for the iodine on our reactant? Okay. Our charge must equal 0. So it's going to be the sum of our oxidation states. Okay. We have to be careful, kind of implied it in the sum of the oxidation state. It's the sum of the oxidation states for every atom. So what does that mean? There are two iodines, so two times the oxidation state of iodine plus five times the oxidation state of oxygen. That now must equal zero. So x has to equal positive 5. It's a negative 10, 2x. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. How about for the oxygen? I keep saying oxygen. How about for the carbon on the reactant side? That one you might be able to do in your head. Oxygen is a negative 2, so the carbon had better be positive 2. Okay. Why do I not factor in this issue with the 5? I factored in the issue with the 5 and the 2 over here. It applies to both. Okay. The 2 and the 5 that I had to use before applied only to one of them, not the other. Okay. If we go through and do it on the product side, uh, in fact, I'm going to cheat. If we do it on the product side, now you guys got the basics of it, you should be able to come up with those results, right? How did you get iodine zero? 
Oh, never mind. Yeah, that was the one exception we needed to talk about. Let's look at iodine being a zero. It's because it has no charge. How many iodines are there? Two. Two times the oxidation state of iodine must equal zero. the overall charge of zero. So what does X have to be? Okay. X has to be zero. Okay. This is our other case on where oxygen could be a zero. If I have oxygen in its elemental state, O2, what's the oxidation state of the oxygen? Zero. Okay. For the exact same reason. And this goes back to what you were saying. Anything in its elemental state will have an oxidation state of zero. Why? In its elemental state, its charge is zero. It's the only element there, which then means x must equal zero. Because in that case, they're sharing electrons equally. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. So what changed is we went from iodine plus five to iodine zero. Okay. So we all heard two different answers. One looking at the electrons. We went from a plus five to a zero. The only way to do that is if we added electrons to it. Because electrons are negative, what happens to the oxidation state? It's going to go down. So it had to gain electrons. Why do we not look at protons? Nope. Well, true, nothing happened with protons, but why not look at the protons? Why did the protons not change? Couldn't I have just lost protons? I wouldn't have iodine anymore. So the only thing we can change are the electrons. We can't touch the protons. And since the neutrons don't contribute to charge, we aren't, won't look at those either. Okay. So we had to have gained electrons when it comes to the iodine. What happened to the oxygen? To the oxygen? Negative 2 to negative 2. Nothing happened to the oxygen. No change to its oxidation number. What happened to the carbon? Carbon went from a plus 2 to a plus 4. How does it become more positive? It had to lose negative charge. There's our electrons, loss of electrons. Okay. So by looking at the oxidation states, we can notice what things have changed. And those are difficult things to look at because when we look at our equation, does it say anything about the number of electrons? No. The electrons are always hidden from our view. Okay. We only look at the elements. Okay. After that, we then have to have some definitions behind what each thing means. The one that I've remembered is loss of electrons is defined as oxidation. Gain of electrons is defined as reduction. Leo the lion says, grr, we can go back to our cats. Okay? It helps me remember it. It's the one that's stuck in my head. That's the only one I used. Okay? The one that is apparently more popular, at least at this campus, is oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Okay. Either way you remember it, I don't care. But you do need to know which one's oxidation and which one's reduction. Okay. To do that, it's obnoxious because you have to look at your oxidation states and see how those oxidation states changed. Some simplifications. Does oxygen ever change? No. So don't look at oxygen. Look to your other elements to see what happens to them. Okay. Deciding oxidation versus reduction, there is kind of an alternative story behind the origin of those names on why we have oxidation and reduction. Okay. The oxidation comes from the oxygen changing locations. Okay. Which species was oxidized according to this, our chart? Which one lost electrons? Carbon. What changed to carbon in our course of a reaction? CO2. CO2. It has more oxygens. That's why it was oxidized. Oxidation just means gaining of oxygen. Okay, that was the original discovery behind it. Why would we look at that as our original discovery? Well, how much oxygen is out there? Okay. There's a lot of oxygen. It's responsible for a lot, pretty much all life. Okay. So that's actually one of the things that we're taking advantage of when we're looking at our reactions, is the oxidative power of oxygen. Why do we call it oxidative power? Because it's oxygen that's doing it. It's the one that's doing the reaction. The other one is reduction. Okay, well, that's because we're adding more of the red element. 
No, that didn't make any sense. Okay. Where did you get reduction from? Because you started to suggest it. Because uh, it's something you're like gaining some electrons. So gaining means reduction? Yes. Gaining yes. means a lower number. Charge. What happened to your oxidation number? It got smaller. It was reduced. There's your reduction terminology. By looking at the oxidation state, we can see that it shrunk. That means a reduction occurred. Okay. So that's kind of our bulk origin on the names, oxidation versus reduction. You ultimately need to be able to look at a reaction and decide what was oxidized, what was reduced. Okay. It takes time because you have to be able to process all those oxidation states. Okay. And you should have remembered from 152 that this was so much fun, you always wanted to do it for the rest of your life, and you had it all nice and easily memorized. Okay. So let's add one more little wrinkle to this. You will sometimes hear agents coming into play, like a reducing sugar. What happened to a reducing sugar? It was oxidized. It was oxidized. What the F? <laughs> okay. Why? It's that agent aspect. A reducing sugar is a reducing agent. It caused something else to be reduced. Why do we want to reference it that way? I have no clue, but that's the nomenclature system that comes out of it. Okay. So if you see the ING or agent or the ANT being associated with your ox or red, be a little bit more careful. It typically means the opposite thing is happening to that species. Okay. So just watch out for that. Be aware of it. It's annoying. So you could go through, determine all of these, and then you could apply oxidizing agents and reducing agents. So what was the oxidizing agent? Okay. So remember, our oxidizing agent means the opposite thing happened to it. So it needed to be reduced. So our iodine was the one that was reduced. But did we start with iodine? No, what did we start with? Our I2O5, iodine oxide isn't technically correct. It's diiodide, pentaoxide. We don't care about the nomenclature, but yeah, just for reference. That's why you hear me say I2O5. Okay. Our I2O5 is now the oxidizing agent, not the iodine. Okay. Iodine is the atom that was reduced, the agent was the molecule that contained the atom that was reduced. Okay. Our agents will also only be found on... Where in the equation? You're right. On the left. On the left. There will only be reactants. We won't look at labeling agents for products. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. The reaction has already occurred at that point. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Okay. How many of you are happy with dealing with all those rules and all those calculations? Yeah, you don't want a shortcut? Yes, please. Okay, let's, let's go with a shortcut. Okay. <clears throat> so in biochem, we're dealing with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, well, if we only have those three elements, and we said oxygen was our definition for oxidation, well, what happens is we add more oxygens. We become more oxidized. Well, if we start with carbon, which is hydrogens, and I go all the way up to CO2, what happened? I was oxidized. Okay. Relatively simple. I don't have to worry about any other kind of weird rules. Okay. Officially, it applies to more electronegative elements. And we'll see a couple cases where that can become problematic. Oxygen is the most electronegative, or second most electronegative. Okay. So when we add more oxygen, we're always adding more electronegative elements. Okay. So that's our oxidation rule. Okay. Well, what happens when we do the reverse? What's the opposite of oxidation? Reduction. Okay, so we're reducing it to go the reverse. Okay, what else could I look for in the structure? So the easiest way is oxidation was more bonds to oxygen. If I do the reverse, less oxygen. Okay, just double it back the other direction. 
That applies under most circumstances in biochem because we're looking at a lot of cases where it's just oxygen being exchanged. Okay? There are other cases that get a little bit dicier when we're not seeing oxygen directly being involved. So it might be useful if we could notice a different pattern than just oxygen. What else is changing as we go from CO2 to CH2? Right. As we go from CO2 down to CH2, we are losing oxygens. We said we can't look at oxygens anymore. We can look at hydrogens. We have gained hydrogens. <coughs> the gaining of hydrogens is reduction. <laughs> Loss of hydrogens is our oxidation. Okay. That can help us go through and deal with that process. Okay. So that, you can look at an equation now and say, what happened to my molecule? Did it increase the oxygen bonds? Oh, that's oxidation. Did it decrease the oxidation or oxygen bonds? Okay. That's uh, reduction. Did it increase the hydrogen bonds? Reduction. Decrease the hydrogen bonds? Oxidation. Okay. That can help you zero in. Some of the things you do have to watch out for, you have to pick the atom that did the chemistry changing. So it's not the overall molecule, it's the atom where chemistry occurred. Okay, and decide, did that one have more oxygen or less oxygen attached to it? I know that's a tricky statement without looking at an example, but we'll see some examples. Okay. But in this case, the carbon is the one. So in this case, there's only one carbon, so it's really clear. But if I went through and drew a larger structure out here... Then it would be whatever carbon is the one and wherever it's Yeah, so because I do have a general skeleton structure, structure we can work with this. Let's say we do this reaction. What happened? Oxidation or reduction? As a hint, it's a trick question. Nothing happened. It's neither oxidation or reduction. The chemistry that occurred, okay, at best happened at our carbon. What happened to the amount of oxygens attached to our carbon? Nothing. Okay. So this is not oxidation or reduction. So when we're saying increase the number of oxygen bonds, we have to decide where our reaction occurred and say, did it increase or decrease oxygens at that atom? Well, nothing happened to the carbon. What happened was at the oxygen. Okay. Did I increase or decrease oxygen bonds to that oxygen? No. Okay. We could say, well, it's a loss of hydrogen, right? But, you put back whatever was the but we replaced it with an element of lower electronegativity. So it's not technically a loss of hydrogen. When we lose hydrogen, we have to replace it with an element that is more electronegative than the parent atom. Okay. We lost an electronegative element. We gained, a, or sorry, lost a low electronegativity element we gained a low electronegativity element. The net result was nothing changed. Okay. So this is not classified as a redox reaction, even though more oxygens made it into the structure. It's not more oxygens at our site of reactivity. That kind of makes sense? Okay. It's a little bit tricky. I think you guys can do it. The official way to look at it, um, and I can't remember if I force you to do this or not in the homework, I won't ask you to do it on, on an exam, is picking your atom and looking at its official oxidation state. Okay. We can go back and look at our old rules that we had up here. Okay. It'll become very, very tedious to go through and do, say, even glucose. Glucose has six carbons in it, six oxygens, a ton of hydrogens. I mean, that's going to be a lot, a lot of trouble. So it would be nice if we had a quicker way to go through and do that. If you look at a larger structure, again, find the atom that had some chemistry change to it. Don't do it for every single atom. If nothing changes to it, its oxidation state is not going to change because nothing has changed. You have to find the atom where chemistry has occurred, a bond has exchanged. Then you can go through and look and decide its oxidation state. The way to go through and reference this is what's called homolytic minus heterolytic bond cleavage. Homolytic means what? 
sort of, back to parent. So we're taking each bond, and we look at those electrons, and we say, okay, they need to go back to their parent. So a homolytic is back to parent. Yeah. Okay. A shortcut for that is what I've got referenced underneath it, the valence electrons. Okay, so let's take a look at these two structures. Can I do it for both of these? I'll almost be able to do it. Okay. The homolytic cleavage on that carbon, that's a C. Okay. Take that first bond at the bottom. We need to take the electrons in that bond and take them back to their parent atoms. So there's how many electrons in that bond? Two. One goes to the hydrogen, one goes to the carbon. I do that for each of those bonds. Carbon would have how many electrons? Four. Four. Which happens to be its valence count. Okay. Um, what about for the other carbon? The other structure that we've got at the far end, CO2. We split each of those bonds homolytically. Electrons go back to their parent. How many electrons would be around the carbon? Four. Four, which is the same number. It's the valence electrons. Okay. Minus heterolytic bond cleavage. Heterolytic gets a little bit trickier. What does heterolytic mean? Different, okay? So the electrons need to go to one atom, but not the other. Ooh. Well, which atom gets the electrons? The electrons to your more electronegative. Okay, I don't want to write out electronegative. Chi is the symbol for electronegativity. Okay. Which element is more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon is more electronegative. Not by much, but it is more electronegative. Okay. Which means how many electrons would then be around the carbon? If it takes all of the electrons from those bonds in our methane structure, it gets all eight. What does that answer equal? Negative four. We've now determined the oxidation number for carbon in methane. Go over and take a look at carbon in CO2. Which is more electronegative, oxygen or carbon? oxygen. So what happens to the electrons in the bonds? They all go to the oxygens, which means carbon has how many? Zero. The oxidation number becomes positive four. What happens to the oxidation number as I go from CO2 to methane? I go from a plus four to a... What did I do to the number? I reduced it. It's a reduction reaction. Yeah, I love your little roll, high roll there. That was lovely. Okay. So it still works to go through and calculate it. It requires a little bit more tedium in going through and determining the numbers. Again, I'm not positive if I ask you to do that in the homework. I won't ask you to determine the oxidation numbers on the exam. I might give you a reaction and say, was this, or in fact, I will give you a reaction that says, is this oxidation or reduction? Or neither. Maybe I'll even include a FU multiple choice just so I can have four answers. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. So we'll now look at some of the important molecules that are going to be popping up repeatedly through our metabolic processes. First one we'll look at is NAD plus to NADH. Exactly what we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Yep. So when we take a look at NAD plus to NADH, okay. So ignore all the structural stuff. Let's just look at that formula. Number one, is it balanced? Why not? Yeah. Good call. Where'd the hydrogen come from? Okay. So we need a hydrogen. Where should that hydrogen show up? So I need to add a hydrogen to this reaction to balance it. Where should it show up? The reactant side. Exactly. Okay. Okay, is it balanced now? 
our charge does not balance. The reactant side right now has a positive charge. The product side right now has no charge. So our charge does not balance. If our charge doesn't balance, what does that mean we need to look at? We need to look at our electrons, which then means what type of reaction are we running here? We're doing a redox reaction. Let's keep it simple first. <laughs> this is an example of a redox reaction. So anytime you run a redox reaction in biochem, you will have some redox mediator. Okay? Something is coming in to help suck the electrons away or dump electrons into the reaction. Something needs to catch those electrons. Okay? If we don't go through something like NADH or what we'll see in a second, FADH2, okay, it'll get dumped to oxygen. Well, if oxygen picks up that single electron and isn't controlled, it becomes oxygen radicals. Oxygen radicals are then your free radicals that run rampant and destroy pretty much everything in your body. Okay? Hence, we try to avoid free radicals, okay? or at least rampant free radicals. We need them because that's how our reactions work. We generate oxygen-free radicals through, uh, through oxidative phosphorylation. Okay? So we do need it but we need it to happen in a controlled fashion where we know this is when it's going to happen and nowhere else. Okay. The goal of NADH and FADH2 is to help transfer those electrons around so that we can control exact, the exact moment at which oxygen becomes a free radical. Because okay. if we can control that, then we can then force that oxygen to split and make us water. Water we don't care about, that's everywhere. But a free radical oxygen free floating through the system, not a good thing. So NADH and FADH2 help to stabilize that extra electron to transfer it around. Okay. Now comes in the interesting question of how do we draw this. Okay. What you suggested, which is exactly how I would do it, so thank you for mentioning that, would put the electrons on that hydrogen and say we have H minus or hydride plus NAD plus to make NADH. Absolutely fair game. That is how it should get written because that's probably how it's actually getting done in the biology. Okay. Is that how it would have to be done? But if you look at your textbook, <laughs> you look at <laughs> any biology textbook, that is not how it's getting written. Yeah, but it's like an electron off by itself. They show two electrons off by themselves. And they show H plus here. They also show 2H plus, and they also show H plus. Okay. Why? They still have to balance the equation, but it's coming down to how they see the reaction being manipulated. When we're looking at oxidative phosphorylation, it's the transfer of electrons from one location to another, and that's ultimately what's causing it. How are those electrons getting transferred? They're getting transferred through hydride. Why don't we just show it as hydride? Well, we aren't transferring hydride per se. We're transferring the electrons, and the hydride is getting dumped off as H plus later on in the reaction. Okay. Those two electrons will turn one of those H pluses into... H minus, which will then react with the NAD plus to make NADH. What happened to the other H plus? Nothing, which is why it has to be shown at the other end that nothing happened to it. Okay. So it comes from how we end up referencing what pieces are going where. Okay. When they look at reactions, they tend to say, well, H plus goes from one side of the membrane to another we're taking H minus from one side of the membrane and we're turning it into H plus to go across. We're sucking those electrons out. So what they've decided is that this is an easier process to explain because when you look at a membrane for oxidative phosphorylation, there's our membrane. That says membrane. We take H plus and we put the H plus on the other side. So biologist says, oh, we just moved the H plus across. How does that happen? Oh, don't worry about it. It just does this equation and it happens. That's what they're telling you. Okay? And it's not that that's necessarily wrong, but if they went through and said H minus here goes across the membrane and becomes H plus, well, people are going, why, 
why is it not minus? Okay. Well, they don't want to explain the science through there because when they first talk about it, you have no chemistry knowledge. Prerequisite for biology is not chemistry. Okay. So they have a hard enough time explaining what H means. <laughs> okay. Because again, no chemistry knowledge. If we now start throwing charges and changing those, it makes it too difficult to explain. So instead of changing the prerequisites, they change the information in that description. Because it's now changed in the biology aspect, it then trickles all the way back down, all the way through into biochem. Okay. So we have to watch out for that system and what's happening and what's changing. Okay. This is to help explain oxidative phosphorylation, which we'll see much, much later. Okay. What we just looked at was what's the bulk change that happened. This is because, believe it or not, you understand chemistry. Okay. So in our understanding of chemistry, what we have to do is say H- is coming from somewhere, reacting with the NAD plus to make NADH. Okay. What structure is now shown down here? Is this the plus form or the H form? This is our plus form. You'll notice that there is a reaction here, and they're showing the hydride. Okay. You'll notice that they, in the product, they didn't show the whole thing. Why not? The other part did not change. The only part that we'll focus on is where the chemistry occurred, which is in the nicotinamide. Okay. In that structure, we have a positive charge on that nitrogen. Does nitrogen want to be positively charged? No. So what does it do? It pulls electrons which then puts a positive charge on another carbon, which can pull electrons down, which puts a positive charge sitting up on this top carbon. How can I stabilize that? That's my hydride coming in to stabilize that positive charge, which then gets me across to the final answer. Why did I not put the hydride in other locations? It comes from how the electrons can be withdrawn from the rest of the structure. If you want to look at that, we can later. We can't do it now because we're done with class. <laughs> but we can go back and look at that. What you're responsible for is acknowledging where that change occurs. It's at that opposite position to the nitrogen. Okay. That's where our hydride is coming in. That's the big change. The rest of the structure does not change. Okay. So we tend to ignore it. That is the part of the A and the D. Nicotinamide, adenosine, which is this part, okay. Uh, what was the D? Dinucleotide. Dinucleotide. Uh, oh, yeah, because this is a, a, a nucleotide. So these two connected are a dinucleotide. Okay. We will pick up there.